Hello, everyone. My name is Harry, and I'm once again joined by the man with the radiator of dreams behind him, Mr. Sam Creasy. Sam, how's it going? Hi, hey, mate. Nice to be back. Indeed. Indeed. Some things have some things have changed. Some things have changed. Um, let's start in in the most recent most recent change, and that's that that Tom fought most recently on on Cage Warriors in London on the undercard of of Jordan Vucinic versus Simona Diana. Do you want to? Firstly, as as sort of a training partner, coach slash mentor type role, do you want to talk me through how that fight went from your perspective, how that camp went from your perspective? And we'll get on to sort of how that went from from you being a brother shortly. Um, I mean, every camp has its ups and downs, but preparation went reasonably well, I believe. Um, Majority of the training partners were there when we needed them. Um, it didn't come with the complete performance that we were hoping for and that I'm waiting to see still. And I think, honestly, anybody who's ever trained with him throughout up and down the country will, <laughs> will tell you exactly the same thing. He's, um, and obviously, like, I'm biased, yeah? I'm, I'm his brother. But when I say he's world class, he's better than the majority of the flyweights in the UK and Europe, in my opinion. If you ask some of these other guys, I, I'm going to guarantee they're going to just nod along. <laughs> um, but, you know, shit happens. Poor performance for him, you know. And uh, we go back to the drawing board. We go put right the wrongs. So you say go back to the drawing board. What does that in in your sort of team in your sort of world? What does that what does that actually look like? Um, pick apart the mistakes. Pick apart any kind of holes, any issues in the camp, any issues during the fight, any issues, kind of like things that the coaches have noticed that he felt himself. Um, we've already spoken about a few, um, but a lot of these things are what ifs, what if this, what if that, what if this had happened, <laughs> you know, and you're not in there. You know, I, I said this m many times, like oh, with, with other people, you should have done this, you should have done this. Absolutely. I should have done that. But at that exact moment in time, that feeling of going for that shot, boo, that's not right. I'm going to get clocked hard and maybe I'm going to go to sleep. You know, so, you know, the, the pressure's all all on the guy who's in there, you know, doing the thing. It's, we're, not, we're not playing a game. We're, we're not like, you know, we've not got the, the PlayStation remote. <laughs> you know, he's not kicking when I'm telling him to kick, you know. Um, so we, we, we're going to break it down. But... You know, he, he trains he trains very hard, he trains at a very high level and he is a he's a consummate professional. The the little issues that we had in there will be uh, corrected and you know the next performance I'm hoping you're gonna see a little glimmer of what is a terrifying prospect. So for you as a brother mm. for somebody that makes this walk and has made this walk many 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 times in his career taught me through what it's like walking it through with your brother are you able to detach emotionally are you not able to detach emotionally what's it like watching him fight what's it like in the aftermath win lose or draw as a brother um it's quite horrific at times <laughs> honestly on the walkout uh, my heart is racing. I got bloody, I got, I got tears on on the edge of my eyes when it come out. And I don't want him to go in there. I want to go in there and beat this guy up. I want to go in there first. But you know, that it, I, I'm level headed enough to know, right? He's fine. <laughs> he can do everything better than I can do it anyway. And um, once he's in the fight and that, you know, I, I'm going to try and give him advice and try and stay as emotionally detached as I possibly can. If I can't, I've got to ask somebody else to take over, which is why I said before the fight to, to Danny, 
who who was the other coach in the corner. You take the lead. If I see something, I'm going to call it. But you're the guy who's going to give him technical advice with no emotions. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then the breakdown after the fight, you know, like we're at our closest when we're talking about martial arts, fighting, competing, how we've just performed. That's when like we can truly be honest. And, you know, we spent, you know, we, we jumped in my motor after the fight and that he'd seen all of his mates and that said thank you to everybody, spoken with the opponent, jumped in my van, drove back and we had a good conversation for, you know, for a couple of hours on the way home, just trying to dissect things, letting it stew, trying to just kind of remember some of these moments and see what we could have done better. And then again, the next morning he called me, we spoke about some other bits and pieces and, you know, it it hurts it, it, it hurts so much because he's my brother double as much as you know that when any of my guys fight and I see them with the possibility of being hurt it hurts me as well but with that, that family connection that bond and that it's just it's heartbreaking um. <laughs> so how and and with all respect to Tom, forget Tom for now. How do, how do you how do you compartmentalize that? Because you are the older brother, right? You are the the leader, the person that that pushes forward, the person that sets the tone. You know, you've mentioned some of the things that that he does, where you know you go and you speak to the opponent afterwards. You immediately dissect the fight. Well, this is something that that you've done, right? You go in the back, mm -hmm. you text your family you say i'm okay it's fine i'm okay and then immediately you're with your coaches like fuck we could have we could have done that or i should have done this one this happened or i should have and immediately your your thoughts are towards your opponent towards your the safety of your opponent to, to show mm -hmm. your opponent the respect like you're obviously setting these standards in the creasy family when you watch your brother go out regardless of whether you give the advice, don't give the advice, you are there, you are in the corner, you are ever present both in your brother's life, but equally in that, in that moment, when you walk away, when you're driving that van home, when you go to sleep that night, how do you compartmentalize that he has put all of this work into the camp and the fight didn't go how you wanted it to? Well, you say go to sleep. <laughs> Uh, Fair enough. That's, something Fair enough. That, that's something that never happens anyway. Like that, that, that was, you know, that's, that's running through my head, like consistently, like throughout the drive back when I'm home, when I'm absent, I'm knackered. I need to sleep. We've been cutting weight. We've been, <laughs> it's been stressful. You know, like there's a lot of emotions attached to this thing. And then uh, I'm not sleeping afterwards because, you know, I'm, I'm trying to look at, ways we can dissect you know performance and look at moments in the fight which could have changed drastically what happened and could have led in his favor and what led to the other guy's success um honestly like part of that part of the whole reason i'm even in this sport is because of my brother like he like he he started before me. He pushed me into this sport. He's been like one of the most unlucky people I've ever met with his injuries. And that has held him back a long, long way. But if anything, he, he, he has pushed me to, to first of all, get into the sport even, and then to really understand what martial arts is about and like watching him be like so respectful with his opponents and that, and the way he trains, the way he conducts himself, has taught me like how I should conduct myself as well, you know. Um, but it's um, like uh, today, even I've just taught another class. My brother was there <laughs> watching, talking it over with different people, discussing ways that, you know, what went wrong from their point of view and, you know, how we're going to improve in the future. Um, and I've, 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 I don't know how many times I've told him, but like, I, I know how good he is. The, the improvements that he needs to make or the changes that he make needs to make are minimal. Performance-wise, 
it's just we get out there and we perform like a professional the next time and we uh, capitalize on these um these advantages that we have it's so the pain is so evident right i can like i can feel it brimming off you and i uh i think that's one of the reasons why your performances have been what they are both good and and bad is because of how deeply invested you are in this mm -hmm. not just as a not just as a man right not just as a as a fighter but as a martial artist right as a yeah. as a as a conductor if you will of this mm -hmm. thing that we've that we've embroiled ourselves in um and i can only imagine that that tom is very similar but i uh yeah from from personal experience of watching my friends fight or even even compete when it's grappling the 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 level of emotions that you run through are oftentimes way higher and way yeah. more intense than the person that's even competing in the first <laughs> yes. um so we'll take a we'll take a, a a small pivot um you have a main event in birmingham mm -hmm. a new promotion let's start there mm -hmm. new promotion new changes new scenery talk me through that um i've been i've been trying to get a fight for a while now um after my last fight i have been in shape and not injured for the first time <laughs> uh so both my fights last last year i was injured for and having come through my my last fight in rome at the end of october i was injury free so i was like fantastic get me a fight before christmas okay no fight came up came up so uh we're pushing for the new year and again nothing coming along um and i saw that aaron ab was waiting on an opponent that was kind of a fight that i would want have wanted before um for the title i i assumed um elias was going to be coming back and i could maybe slide in there and get a shot at him um but I saw his name on that card for a while and I was, I said, like, give me the shot. Give me the shot. I'm ready. I, I, I've i been training with my brother and all of the guys for however long getting them prepared. Give me a chance. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, here we are. So does that mean, and just to speak logistically, does that mean that your relationship with Cage Warriors as of right now is finished? Does it mean that there's a slight tenure for this for this title fight? What does that, what does that mean? Uh, for the moment, it's done. I'm going to uh, go and see what Octagon does. We're gonna we're gonna have this title fight. I'm gonna come back with the title, and then um, I'm gonna be their champion for a bit. Um, honestly, I feel like it, it's probably a good time as well. It will allow my brother, you know, a chance to, you know, just be the Creasy, not one of the Creasy brothers, <laughs> and. Um, I know like you could say, you know, the Hardwick brothers are both there, but they're in different weight classes. It's going to be a problem if I carry on taking out flyweights, he's doing the same. And it, it limits the options for, uh, for, for the matchmakers as well. And, you know, Ian's always stressed. <laughs> I can imagine. Um, <laughs> so talk me through, like, obviously you've been at Cage Warriors now for a long time, a large portion of your career. Is the idea of working with a new promotion daunting? Is it exciting? Is it a mixture of both? Like what, what things are you looking forward to? What things are you nervous about with, with working with a different promotion? Um, I, I'm looking forward to it in a sense. There's always that kind of the familiarity of, of where you've been for a long time is something you don't want to, uh, I don't, know. I don't want to go away from it's the routine you know what happens when i go to a cage warriors event i know who i'm speaking to i know who's going to look after me i know if i need to get this this person's going to sort it for me kind of know the routine when we get to the venues and that so this is going to be a whole new new change for me and something something i am looking forward to um but it'll also be you know a new experience as well so i'm going to um run into some um some roadblocks as well if you like probably <laughs> almost certainly and i mean the card itself is is pretty good there's some there's some really really solid names on that card and equally obviously you are the main event um 
does it change anything for you in terms that you're dropped immediately into a title fight? Obviously, the Aaron Aby. Uh, to be honest, I can't believe you guys haven't competed already at this point. Both been around uh, the European scene. Oh, no, we have. You have competed before. Yeah. That's my apology. That's my... <laughs> um, I didn't... I People even think we haven't. Notes. It's in my notes. I can't believe why I've just said that. It's yeah. In, in my but, um, yeah, like, I... Uh, yeah, does it does it change anything driving you back immediately into a title fight? Um, there's a little pressure on me. Um, it is a it is a last minute fight, really. If it was three rounds, you know, I've been prepping for three rounds with my brother, everybody else for a while now. Um, it's five rounds straight into a main event. You know, it, it it's a lot more pressure if you like. But, you know, we, we've done this before. Um, we, we've fought before. Um, and it's going to be an interesting fight because when we fought, it was his first fight back after illness. And, you know, I don't think he was the same fighter then that he is now. He looks physically stronger. He, he looks like he, he's uh, he's changed his game a little bit more. He looks a bit more comfortable on the feet as well now. Um, so we'll see. It's, it's, it's going to be an interesting fight, though. I, I'm looking forward to it and um, seeing how it plays out. So that was going to be my second point. You've already kind of touched okay. on it. Like, <laughs> with, with the, with the, the short notice, mm -hmm. obviously you've been in camp, but not really. Right. Because, you know, we've talked about this before. When you're preparing for other people, you are very much selfless. You are very much there as a body to ensure that the other person prepares correctly and prepares as efficiently and as wholesomely as possible. Mm -hmm. That was there for your guys and, and for Tom specifically in the last little while. Now there's a very, very quick shift ever since this fight has been sort of talked about and announced that there has to be a level of selfishness from you to ensure that you're not just physically, but mentally prepared to go in and, and compete, not just in a five round fight, but for a world title. Does, does the short notice, do you think favor you? Does it allow you to take some of that pressure off? It hasn't, you know, you've not had 10 weeks to think about it, eight weeks to think about it, stew over it, mull over it. Do you think the short notice, uh, works for you do you prefer it like where are you on the on the short notice side of things uh, it does add pressure absolutely it does add pressure and you know when i was younger i probably would have let that get in my head a little bit but I, i'm a little bit more mature now um we, we've done a couple of tests and that and i've shocked myself a little bit with how fit i am um i can do the five rounds I'm fit to go, and I think it's probably testament to the fact that I stay in shape most of the year. I could make weight this week if necessary. Um, you know, uh, I, I, I kind of like the odds being stacked against me a little bit as well. You know, I, I loved fighting in London, but it started to feel like, like, uh, like hometown for me, if you like, and home territory and... I've always thrived, especially when I was like starting out my career is going into enemy territory, being the one, being the underdog, having the odds stacked against you a little bit. Kind of that, that, that was where I was at my best, I think. Or, or sorry, I enjoyed it. You mentioned that actually in, in our last conversation before Rome is that you enjoyed going and being in enemy territory. Can you touch on, if you were to introspect, why is it that you prefer that you want the odds stacked against you? You want people doubting you. You want to be the underdog. You want to be walking in enemy territory. What What is that? Good question. <laughs> uh, if I'm honest, I, I'm, I'm not really sure. It's something I've probably, I think I've had with me a lot of my life, honestly, throughout my, throughout my childhood, uh, growing up in all aspects of my life. I've always not really expected or had not had a great deal of expectation put upon me. Um, and I like to, um, I like to upset the odds. I kind of, I like that added pressure. 
because I want people to doubt me now. And it, the thing is, with this, I know I'm good. <laughs> I know I'm world class. So <laughs> that doubt is a, a really nice little push to get me to kick my ass into gear that little bit more, if you like. Because, you know, it, 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 I, I, know I'm, I know I'm good enough. But sometimes, you know, we do need a, you know, a slap sometimes <laughs> or a kick up the ass just, just to make sure that you are good enough. Now you need to be in shape, you need to be prepped, you need to be sharp. Everything needs to be on point. There's a there's sort of a mental conundrum happening here, right? Where you are aware enough, confident enough, happy enough to admit that you are good enough one, to be in this fight, two, to win this fight, and two, to win this fight well, or three, to win this fight well, sorry. But there then has to be the this sort of, I don't want to use the word like self-hatred or, or like uh, almost or almost like a level of abuse to yourself where you have mm. to meter those meet to those feelings a little bit and and continue to tell yourself that actually you're not as good as you could be or there are things missing or there are this or there are that to sort of bring yourself back down to a level whereby you can approach this in this in I, i'm gonna i'm gonna term it the sam creasy way which is incredibly humble incredibly full of humility and full of professionalism because if you were to allow yourself to run away with the i'm definitely good enough to be here i'm definitely good enough mm -hmm. to do this that will likely have adverse effects in and of itself so how do you and you know maybe this is a maturity thing maybe this is a we are where we are in your career thing but how do you balance that at this point today in 2024 how do you balance the knowledge that you are world class you are at a point where you should be fighting for world titles in these organizations but also still turn up to training and still be a student and still be the 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 person that is welcome and willing to learn and tell themselves they're not quite good enough yet um honesty really like it, it it's a it's a thing that comes around often you know coming up to fight week coming into fight day preparation where your mind will play many tricks on you and i've learned to kind of harness that now um to help me you know every day in the gym pretty much you know i i'm honest enough to know you know i i am i'm a good athlete yeah i'm a i'm a very good martial artist and i can put everything together fantastically well for mma but when i go in the gym every single day i'm a beginner yeah i'm not I, I i'm not a master of anything you know so each of these martial arts that i'm going to learn whether it's you know some grappling some wrestling some boxing some muay thai i'm a beginner i'm average i'm not i'm not good enough yet and i'm always searching for like a little bit of improvement in every single area and then when i put it together the package that is world class, the MMA game, can only ever improve. And there's there's what what's that word they say? We we're the saying you're endlessly searching for perfection with the knowledge that perfection is unattainable. Because every day I must improve somewhere. And I try to tell my students this as well, like get your, your notepad out, put five goals for your five rounds that you're gonna do today and five things that you want to achieve. That can be, keep your hands up. <laughs> that can be, don't get caught with this one shot that this guy always catches you with, yeah? Don't get swept. Don't, don't, don't give up a submission. Don't give up this position on this guy who forever gets it on you. Whatever it may be, it's, it's those little attainable goals that you can use that like, I'll, I'll use myself. How, and this is a personal question, how do you allow uh, how was the best way to, to to phrase this like how do you have the confidence to coach when you still have the knowledge that you are in your words average a beginner everywhere right? how does how do you how do you feel like there's enough in there that you can pass that on to the further generation that's uh that's that's another good question because I, I do feel at times I'm a fraud. You know, I, 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 look at, I, I look very much down upon myself at times. And 
uh, I'm also aware of the fact that I have picked up a lot of knowledge throughout all of my training, throughout all of these competitions over the years and that, and I can only pass on what I know as best as I can to give guys the best option to fight in the safest way possible to go back to their families, you know, injury free. And so I'll give them, I'll give them as many options as I can with their safety in mind, first and foremost, because not everybody wants to learn like, you know, very boring techniques that are very good for controlling somebody positionally and taking them to, they want to learn something flying, something wild, some jump, jumping, spinning. I'm like, please don't do that. <laughs> please don't do that. I'm fighting. Just grab him, get a hold of him, drag him to the ground, beat him up. That's good. That's it. Your mum would be happy with me. I'm not going to get told off afterwards. <laughs> it's a, it's a really difficult thing that I contend with also, right? Like I teach a couple mm -hmm. of classes and I've, for the last year I've been, I've been coaching um, at a uni and, and some of those, some of those students are, were absolute day one beginners, complete mm -hmm. beginners, never done anything athletic in their life, let alone yeah. any grappling. And sometimes I, I, I struggle to contend with the idea that it's me that has to coach them, you know, yeah, like that's, yeah, yeah. that's an incredibly daunting thing sometimes. Um, but I, uh, I wanted to ask mostly, as I said, just, just for my own self, but, but because I think there's, there is something, there is something beautiful about showing, I guess, that you have experience, right? You've, you've done this, you've made that walk many a time, both amateur and pro. You have been a student of the game for the entire time that you've been a martial artist. And I'm sure regardless of retirements or, or anything other than that, as and when your time is done in the cage, you'll continue to be the same thing. But there's, there's a, there's a beauty, I think, uh, in, in showing your students that you're not the finished article and never will be, but that's, that's okay. And, and it's also okay for your students to be better than you in certain areas or even all of the areas. Cause that's, that's really the goal. And so I just, I wondered how, how you contended with that is all. Yeah. I mean, that, that's, that, that's a really, that's a really good point. And that's, that's something I, I tried to try to show them like, I am the epitome of average at everything, but just, just putting it all together so well. I say to them forever, like a lot of you are better strikers than me, but I can make it appear in MMA as if I'm a better striker than you. And that's an absolute lie. <laughs> I, I'm not. I'm convincing you of that because my ability to do that in MMA is greater than your ability to strike at the minute for your own MMA game. And when you get that, guess what? I'm not going to be striking with you anymore. I'm going to take you down straight away. <laughs> um, but it, it's trying, it's trying to te teach them, you know, to be, to be constantly searching for somewhere that you can kind of improve on. You know, they'll say, oh, I can't do this. Well, but, well, are you using the pressure in the right area? Because like I've said this a lot more recently with uh, a lot of the submissions and the positions I'll get people in, it's not necessarily about your positioning as such, because I can put you in a perfect triangle, right? But where is your intent? So if you, if you, if you don't have intent with the right muscles, you know, you, your triangle can be on, absolutely wonderful like i can look at it from angles perspective and say that's perfect everything's good and then they can grab hold of their head and squeeze the fuck and wonder why they're not tapping for however long or i can set up the triangle and before i even lock it off even before i let, lock my legs together the muscles are firing in the right direction and the intent is in the right places where i know that you're going to submit before you even get there um, and uh, is that's that's another another thing I've been trying to teach my guys. <laughs> that is the level of mastery I think that comes after many 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 hours of doing those mm -hmm. very same things. Because mm -hmm. one of the things that I personally try to coach is the body mechanics, and you just mentioned yeah. it. Like you've summed it up 
as always, very, very beautifully. And it would have taken me a long winding road to get there. But <laughs> the intent, you're absolutely right, that mm -hmm. the, the intent of what your body is trying to achieve, the muscles, the groups of muscles, the, 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 what your body is directing towards another human is how you get submissions, right? As you say, or mm -hmm. regardless, it's the same with striking. Yeah. It's exactly the yeah. same, right? You could, you could see a picture perfect punch and it lands like a feather. Or you can see yeah. a picture perfect punch and it lands like a hammer, you know, like those are, are two very, very, very different things. And it's all about the way that your body intends to move and the intention you have over your body. And I think, yeah, that's a that's a really, really, really beautiful way to describe it, because I think, again, when when people are fresher, either in MMA or in in grappling specifically, they will do something and it will look like how the coach does it. But until yeah. you feel it or until you start to interpret what the feeling means, that's when you start to get the the real, real benefits of it, right? And I just think that only comes from hours and hours and hours and hours and hours and hours of just fucking it up, you know what yes, I mean? And then absolutely. eventually you get it right. You're like, oh, <laughs> if I just did this in the first place, this would have been wonderful. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I... Uh, absolutely. No, I, I, wish, I wish that was a thing. I'm going to pivot slightly. Um, yeah. I've asked this in the last sort of three or four conversations that we've had. Um, and I'm going to ask it again because I think it's poignant to ask it. With a title win on Octagon, 36 years of age, two times X Cage Warriors champion, what does this mean? What does the title do for Sam Creasy? One step closer to the UFC. No doubt. There's never any doubt. It's always just pushing me closer to where I should be, where I belong, with the rest of the world-class athletes that I know I already am. So I had a, an auxiliary question about the UFC. And, and again, I'm gonna, I, I think I've asked it before and I'm going to ask it again. Has your position changed at all since we last talked about the UFC? Now, I'll break that question down into sort of two, two aspects. One being, obviously the athletic side of the UFC is still as strong as it ever was, um, mm -hmm. especially at flyweight. Um, but the, the UFC as a business, the UFC as a brand, the way that the UFC is marketing itself and its athletes, frankly, in some fashion, does that, has your position changed at all on wanting to be tied with an organization like that? Honestly, not. I'm still that that since 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 I found out that I was half decent at this sport, that has been the only place, the only place I've ever stuck my goals on, stuck my dream on. That's where I want to be. That's where I want to show that I belong. You know, and I I I'm privileged to be able to fight on these shows as well. You know, they're fantastic shows, but. I will always have the goal that the UFC is where I get to show I'm a world champion. And I don't know whether this is a thing, like obviously in, in Cage Warriors, for instance, when, when you win a title, there's a champion's clause and, you know, these sorts of things. Is that the same thing at Octagon or has there ever, has there been conversations around if you win a title here, the UFC are taking notice? Like, has there been any of those sorts of conversations for you? Uh, I think I believe there is a champion's clause as well, so I would need to defend the title mm -hmm. should I win it. Um, but there is always a release clause for the UFC, right? Um, and that's where I want to be. <laughs> is there any certainty? Is there any? Have you had conversations with the UFC as to, look, I've won the Cage Warriors title twice. I'm now in another promotion. I'm potentially going to win another title. What, like, what are we, what are we doing? What are we waiting for? Honestly, no. I, I'm, and I'm just going to carry on doing what I'm doing, beating people in front of me. Um, you know, there, there's a lot of flyweights out there across the world, a lot of flyweights across Europe who are doing the same thing making some noise, showing what they're capable of, you know, and calling for their shot, you know. And if if I'm deserving, you know, I, I'll get my chance. If it's meant to be, it will be. Um, and if not, the goal doesn't die. The dreams don't end. 
I'll keep on going until, uh, you know, till it's time to disappear. <laughs> I wanted to ask, uh, and just as a sort of a, again, this is sort of a personal question for me, like there seems to be this, this strange criteria to get signed to the UFC recently, especially for European fighters. Like, take Ian Gary out of the equation, and obviously the, the stalwarts that have already been there, Laro Murphy, Paddy, Molly, these sorts of people, Nathaniel Wood, obviously. <clears throat> it used to feel as though if you win a Cage Warriors title, maybe defend it once, maybe defend it twice, then the UFC come knocking. Right? The UFC at least come and ask some questions. Now, there may be a decision like Paddy Pimlet made that he would prefer to stay in Cage Warriors and, and sort of make make himself a little bit more experienced, a little bit more accomplished. And, and I think that was the right choice for Paddy at, the, at, at that time. Mm -hmm. But I'm looking now at the likes of Paul Hughes, the likes of Jordan Vucenic, yeah. Yeah. the likes of, of James Sheehan, who's obviously got a big fight coming up in Cage Warriors uh, very, very soon, yourself. Like, there are fighters that that seemingly were UFC bound for Paul Hughes and, and John Vucenic two years ago, for yourself you know, four or five years ago. Do you think there is auxiliary criteria that maybe isn't talked about that either put you in the shop window or take you out of the shop window for the UFC? I guess so. I guess so. Uh, uh, honestly, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a funny time with some of their decisions for the guys that they have signed, uh, when I see some of their records and see some of their fights, I'm a little just, <laughs> it's very difficult to understand when you have Paul Hughes, Jordan sitting on the sidelines and both of those guys should already be in the UFC. Those fights should have been in the UFC. <laughs> um, so I don't know whether they've changed their criteria for who they're signing, but um, they signed the kid, the the bantamweight from uh, Calbon. Um, yeah, right off the bat, okay. yeah, um, he's just one. So I I don't know whether it changes from weight class to weight class. Perhaps mm -hmm. I know there is a lack of interest always in flyweight, um, or has been, um, but the the featherweights it just I'm baffled. <laughs> I, I, I agree. can't see it. <laughs> the the gentleman that was part of that trio of Paul Hughes and and, and Jordan Vichenik was Morgan Charrier, and he obviously mm -hmm. got signed. Then you've got the likes of George Hardwick and Harry Hardwick. George Hardwick was forced down the Dana White Contender Series route, and I thought that was quite strange. Um, it just seems I don't know from from a fighter's perspective, is it is it disheartening at all? Because you've got the guys, the likes of those guys, and I agree with you. Charrier Charrier was signed. Let's be honest, Charrier was signed for UFC Paris. Um, and, mm -hmm. and I completely understand that he has a massive yeah. gargantuan following and that means ticket sales and the UFC like ticket sales. That makes a load of sense to me, but it's not like Jordan Vucenic and Paul Hughes don't have large fan bases. They do. Right. And equally Harry Hardwick, George Hardwick, yourself, big fan bases. I, I just, I, I, I would feel personally quite disheartened and I would be turning around and asking the question of like when what do I like what do I need to do what more do I need to do do does do you ever find yourself disheartened um well I'm, I'm a slightly different story simply because I've made terrible mistakes and great <laughs> opportunities <laughs> um so I, I'm not exactly the same as those guys if if I'm honest like Jordan should have been signed before this. I mean, he looks the part. He's marketable. Paul should have been signed. I don't know why he's not now. He he talks the talk. He walks the walk, you know, and, and he's got a big fan base as well. Um, perhaps if they bring it back to the UK, I think later on this year, one of those guys will get signed. I'd like to see both of them signed, honestly, but... Maybe they bring it to Ireland at some stage in the future, and maybe they're looking at it in that kind of, I don't know, uh, business kind of model at the minute with uh, signing Morgan for the French card. How many UK UK guys have they got? I don't know who they've got featherweight UK wise. Daniel, Marone, Marone. Maybe Jackson. they got a number. Of, yeah, maybe they got a number of people they like to have in, and then they're not going to sign anybody else. Unless one of those guys gets booted, sort of thing. So, 
from a business point of view, that that's probably the most likely way I can look at it. But I still think both of those guys should have been signed, and it's a shame they haven't yet. Indeed, indeed. And I want to uh, sort of the final thing that I want to touch on, and then we'll we'll bring it round to something slightly more positive. Is <laughs> is just sort of I wanted to get your thoughts on on the landscape of of MMA, MMA media, MMA fandom, because mm-hmm. it feels as though MMA media seems to be disappearing very, very, very rapidly. Sites like Bloody Elbow falling apart, people being dismissed from large other sites. And it, it really seems as though that is a, a problem in and of itself and a problem to the scene. And then you look at some of the way that, that fans act right now. And I think this is really quite siloed to the UFC. At least my perspective is, is quite siloed to the UFC. There was a press conference recently uh, for UFC 300, where where fans were saying some things to Kayla Harrison and Armin Saryukin that they would mm-hmm. definitely not say if they were three foot in front of them. There, mm-hmm. just the way that that certain fans speak about fighters as as though they are unhuman, right? As though they are just objects for entertainment. I wanted to get your your specific thoughts on on sort of those two points, and and does it does it ever make you question your i mean your your specific choice in career right like does it does it are you able i mean obviously you're able to compartmentalize those two things but but how does that happen right how are you able to do that well the first point about the media and that 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 is obviously that, that that's a big issue because the we want more, more people involved in the sport, and we we need more journalists, more people who are asked, asking for interviews, speaking to the fighters, getting to know the fighters, and asking questions that are not just, you know, the same, the same narrative that is on every interview we've ever seen, you know, or it's the same press conference questions. The second part is something that has evolved through social media over the years and it, it, it it's apparent obviously in social media where people can say what they want and there are very very little consequences online you you, you only have to go on a fighter's profile after a fight and watch the torrent of just nasty abuse that they get and it's you know it's it's things that you couldn't possibly say to somebody ever in their presence. Just the audacity of some of the <laughs> some of the stuff that is spouted from their gobs is unbelievable. And you know, I'm surprised to see it actually at a press conference in person. But that's I feel like it's just it's it's come on from the social media side and people think they can get away with it now. And you know, that's a dangerous game. That's a very dangerous game. And, you know, fighters are emotional creatures anyway. (laughs) You're probably picking the wrong time to do it often. If they're in a camp, weight cutting, there's a lot of pressure involved there as well. And you've seen how people react badly. You know, it's, it's, it's a sad, sad thing that's come. I don't even just say into the sport. It's just from social media. It's everywhere. Every profile, Twitter. YouTube, <laughs> you know, you, you can watch a video, uh, click down, let's see what the comments say. Oh, right. <laughs> wow. That's nice. You know, and it's, yeah, it's, it's just sad. And, you know, people just need to be better. Honestly, like, I don't, I don't see how they, how they can live their lives like that. It, it's, it's, it's a strange thing because I guarantee walking down the street, if they saw me, or saw anybody, they they just would not use that same language. No, they wouldn't. And and I think I think you've summed it up beautifully in that they just need to be better because you're right that it's not just conducive to MMA. It's not just conducive to to one specific organization. I just think it's it's sort of it's 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 hyper focused on and because of the outreach of the UFC, it is so obvious when when those occurrences happen. I'm sure it happens to, to fighters in cage rows. I'm sure it happens to fighters in Octagon and KSW and all these other, all these other promotions. Um, 
to round us out, I wanted to just to ask you to lay out the plan for 2024. And equally, you you sum things up so beautifully. I want to ask, what's the mantra to 2024? What's the goal of 2024? If we can sum that up in a sentence, what have we got? <laughs> um... Be better, to be better, to be, to enjoy life, to smile more, and to treat people well. Ladies and gentlemen, Sam Creasy, thank you so much as always. It's been a pleasure. My pleasure, my friend.